Good evening, everyone. We have three after seven Eastern time by my clock. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Taylor Monson, and I am the Research Grants Program Officer at the American Neurological Association. And I'm here to talk to you tonight about the Boston Scientific Medical Student Innovation Fellowship. As a general housekeeping note, uh, if you have questions at any time throughout this presentation, please use the Q&A feature and we will read them out at that point in the program. If you experience any technical issues, please uh, let us know and we'll assist to the best of our ability. Um, outside of that, uh, we are recording this webinar and the recording with all associated audio and text information will be posted on our AUA web pages. So if you find you have a question later, please know you can follow up with us and you can share this video with others who may find it of interest. So just a brief overview of our progress tonight. Um, we're gonna talk about this funding opportunity and the elements you see here. Um, the discussion tonight is going to be framed through the lens of an applicant, um, particularly the medical student applicants that this award uh, is, is hoping to support. Once we are done with the information related to the mechanism, we will also have uh, a discussion with the current award recipient from our 2023 competition, where she'll get to tell you about her experiences as an applicant and now recipient of this research grant. And at the end of the discussion, we will take your questions and answer them in real time, uh, both myself and the 2023 recipient. So, for those of you who are not familiar, uh, urology is a surgical specialty that deals with the diseases of male and female urinary tract systems and male reproduction. That includes organ systems such as the kidneys, bladders, ureters, etc. cetera. Um, the field of urology is extremely diverse and it often entails knowledge of other specialties such as pediatrics, gynecology, uh, calcium studies such as kidney stones and bladder stones, et cetera. If you are a medical student who's not familiar with urology, I highly encourage you to check out the resources on our AUA web pages, such as the infographic you see here that highlights some of the big picture um, talking points, takeaways, and introductions to urology as a specialty. So the American Urological Association is the world's premier uh, trade association for urologists, clinicians, and urology physician scientists. Founded in 1902, we have over 23,000 members across the globe with our mission to promote the highest standards of urologic clinical care and we do that through a combination of programming focused on education, research, and healthcare policy related to uh, urology clinical practice. The American Urological Association has chapters or sections that are geographically based. And here you'll see an image of what I mean by that. I kind of make this analogous to uh, fraternity or sorority chapters. Um, this comes into play later on in our discussions. You may already be familiar with the AUA section in your area. Um, these sections feed into the national organization, which is the American Neurological Association. So within the AUA is the Office of Research to pursue the third of the mission that is concerned with advancing urology through research. Um, I work in the AUA Office of Research. We have a particular mission to increase and maintain the workforce of urology physician scientists, those who do surgical practice and do medical research, and researchers, those who may not do any clinical practice but are still actively researching and publishing in a urology disease or function area. 
Uh, we hope to catalyze the advancement of clinical practice and reduce the burden of urologic disease through impactful research. And we do that with three programmatic areas. Advocacy for research funding from federal payers, such as the National Institutes of Health, the Veterans Affairs Department, the Department of Defense, or other payers. We do it through research education with a whole host of research education workshops, annual symposia, skills development courses, et cetera. And for our purposes tonight, we do that by supporting research funding in partnership with our Urology Care Foundation. The Office of Research manages the applications and the review and selection for several research grant mechanisms that we'll get into in a second. If you are not familiar with the Urology Care Foundation, they are the foundation of the American Neurological Association. They raise the funds that then the Office of Research helps compete and award. Their mission is not only to forward urology research by fundraising for research grants, but also to develop patient education resources and more recently to provide urology humanitarian aid across the globe. Um, we have been offering research grants since 1975. We're coming up on our 50-year anniversary. We have funded more than $34 million in urology research in that time to well over 850 uh, different researchers and individual funding lines. This represents more than 100 institutions across the AUA sections. Just to give you an idea of what a year in the research grants department looks like, in 2022, we awarded over $1.4 million in new research grant funding to 49 new early career investigators, and that represents funding for 16 uh, disease areas across urology. We fund every type of research from basic to clinical to translational, we fund mechanistic research, we fund health services and epidemiology research, and everything from kidney stones to benign prosthetic hyperplasia to prostate, kidney, or bladder cancers, etc. So what is the range of funding for the Urology Care Foundation? Well, here you'll see our portfolio of research mechanisms. We have a special focus on early career grant funding. And what I mean by that is we fund research starting with medical students to urology residents to a intensive urology residency research training award. We have a particular two-year program for the development of urology residents from groups underrepresented in medicine. We fund uh, clinical fellows, postdoctorates with PhDs, and early career urology faculty. And then finally, as our most advanced mechanism, we support urology faculty who are going on to establish themselves as independent investigators. Our focus for tonight's discussion is the Boston Scientific Medical Student Innovation Fellowship, which is our newest grant mechanism. And as you'll see in this progression chart, it focuses on the medical students as the applicant audience. So the Boston Scientific Medical Student Innovation Fellowship has very specific intent that makes it different from all of our other grant opportunities. This award is intended to support medical students interested in translating urology research into innovation. What do I mean by innovation? I mean, taking a surgical tool and enhancing it in a way that stands to improve a urology surgical procedure. I may mean a research study protocol that significantly advances the protocol currently used in a line of research on a urology disease area. This award has a particular focus on supporting medical students from groups underrepresented in medicine, as defined by the National Institutes of Health, particularly women of all races and racial and ethnic minorities that are underrepresented in medicine. And what makes this mechanism unique, one of many things, is that this mechanism is particularly geared to introduce the medical student to interactions with the industry sponsor. And in this case, that is Boston Scientific. 
what this means is that there is an opportunity for the awardee to have a site visit at a research and development laboratory with the funder. It also comes with individualized continuing medical education relevant to the awardee's research project, which is quite unique in our funding mechanisms and others. We have one grant available each year for a total of $40,000 in research funding. 20,000 of these dollars will be provided from the Urology Care Foundation directly to the recipient. And the host institution is required to match 100% of that 20,000. So that's 20,000 20, from the Urology Care Foundation, another 20,000 from the host institution for a total of $40,000 in support. The timeline for this mechanism is that applications open in early January. The application materials will be due in March. The selection of the award recipient will happen in April, and then the funding period starts in July. All of these intervals for the 2024 mechanism would be in step. In January 2024, we will have this year's applications open and all associated materials would be due in March 2024. There we go. Who's eligible? Well, that depends. So you have to be able to dedicate 12 months to this award. That's 12 months starting from July 2024 to June of 2025. You have to be able to dedicate 100% effort throughout that time. 100% effort for those unfamiliar means you have no other clinical commitments, you are not on rotation, etc., and you have no academic responsibilities. You must be enrolled or matriculating into an accredited medical school within the geographic boundaries of those AUA sections we talked about earlier. U.S. citizenship is not required as long as your host institution is based within the AUA section boundaries. You must have a project mentor, and this mentor needs to have a strong track record in neurologic research, and they need to have active research funding in order to support you. The host institution must be within AUA section boundaries. They have to be accredited and they have to provide that $20,000 in matching funds. What's involved in applying to this fellowship? Here you'll see a list of all of the applicant components. At first glance, this may seem a little overwhelming, but I'm gonna walk through a couple of them with you. The proposal agreement form, what does this mean? This is an agreement that yourself, your mentor, and your host institution all would sign that essentially ensures all three parties understand your responsibilities, the limitations, and the expectations of the grant. You would need to submit an abstract of the research area that you want to focus in. In addition, you would need to submit a research project description that includes, at minimum, a background narrative of the scientific area that you want to focus on, the specific aims of your project. What are you going to test in your 12 months? What do those outcomes look like? How are you going to avoid any mistakes? You have to talk about the impact of this research project on the urologic research community. How will it improve patient care? How will it forward the current research? And then you have to have a references sheet. This project description has a two-page maximum. Note that the references are not included in this count. You can have as many pages of references as is reasonable for your background narrative and specific aims. You have to have, as the applicant, an NIH bio sketch or a resume. This is specifically an academic resume. In the application, we include a sample of what a bio sketch looks like. The biosketch would be something that you could work on with your mentor, as it is an extremely useful tool as you continue to pursue research funding opportunities. If you're not able to create a biosketch, we do accept an academic resume, and either format, there is a two-page max. You need to include a one-page career plan. Where are you going? 
with your career in medicine, in research, how will this grant uh, influence that trajectory? You have to include a diversity, equity, and inclusion statement that essentially talks about the ways in which your current situation as a medical student, as an award recipient, could impact any improvements in the representation in the field of urology. There's more instruction about this and resources we'll hit on later. You need to include a one-page innovation statement. And this basically talks about how the project you're pursuing is innovative above and beyond the current standard of the field. Your primary mentor needs to include their NIH bio sketch, and they have a five-page maximum. You will need, at minimum, two confidential letters of support. You will need one from your primary mentor, and you will need one from the host of the urology department that is receiving you at their institution. The chair of this department should write this letter and talk about the laboratory resources that they are making available to you and the matching $20,000 that they are committing to your pursuit of this research award. Finally, you need to include a research and facilities description on one page. You can do this with your mentor and you should list what resources as a part of their lab or as a part of the school that you're going to be hosted at are going to be key to conducting your work. Do you need access to specialized equipment that may be part of a shared uh, laboratory space in that college? Do you need specific software programs that your mentor will make accessible to you, et cetera? Now I'm gonna talk about a few key applicant resources as you go about evaluating whether or not this mechanism is right for you and how you can apply. And the first one I'm gonna highly recommend to you is the AUA webpages. There is a host of information on our webpages related to all the research grants we offer. And if you're on our main page, all you need to do is find the research and data header, which will take you to items including AUA research funding, where you can locate the specific mechanism that you want to apply to. And that will drill down into more detailed information about the award, including resources necessary to apply to that. So what you'll see here listed in the yellow box is the program announcement and the proposal agreement form that we mentioned. Now I'm going to talk about the program announcement. This is your one-stop shop. This will detail key dates. It will detail key information on those application components. It has formatting guidelines that you need to follow so that the materials you submit are within our specifications and legible and received well. It also has a list of don't do's, the items that if omitted or presented incorrectly would render the application ineligible. I cannot stress enough that if first you have a question, consult the program announcement. And if it is not in there, then you can contact the AUA Office of Research staff for further guidance. Once you've read through the program announcement and you have a handle on all the application ins and outs, your next step is going to be using the application submission software. We use a software called Proposal Central, which you see in the capture here. You would log in as a researcher and create an account for yourself. This will be extremely helpful for you as you continue applying to other research funding opportunities as many foundations, associations, and other organizations like AUA house their research applications in Proposal Central. Once you've created an account and logged in, you will have access to the application and all of the fields that are involved. This is a full service portal. You can start and stop as you need to. It is a combination of fillable application areas, such as the project title question you see here. And it also includes fields to upload all of those attachments that are part of your application package. There's also a function that allows you to submit your confidential letters of support, where you add the email addresses for your mentor and for the urology department chair it automatically 
pings them and they can submit their letters directly to the software without your having seen it. There is a function that allows you to validate your application. And what that means is the system will automatically show you any fields, any attachments that are not complete. It will prevent you from submitting an application that is not complete, which is really helpful. Once you have fully completed the sections you see here, you've validated your application and you have submitted it to the AUA Office of Research, you'll also get a copy of it for your records. Another thing that's really great about this application system is that they have their own dedicated technical support. If the web page is glitching, if for some reason it's not letting you upload the required attachment, you can contact their customer support team from 8.30 to 5 p.m. Eastern, Monday through Friday, and they have contact available by phone or by email. So you've gone through the program announcement, you've collected all your information, and you've completed the application. What next? Then we will go on to review of the material. The review criteria that I'm gonna go through next are public information specifically to help you create your application in the way that the reviewers will be assessing it. For example, the reviewers that we gather together, the scientific experts that will be evaluating your project to see if it is appropriate, to see if it is feasible, and to see the quality of it compared to others submitted, they're going to be looking at the applicant's achievements, their stated career goals, et cetera, and look at the potential for a successful career in research urology as a physician scientist or a researcher. With this mechanism, applicants from groups underrepresented in the scientific and medical workforce receive priority consideration for available fellowships. Similarly, if we look at the mentor side, you will be able to read this and guide your selection of your mentor when you approach them about your project. The reviewers are going to be looking for if the mentor has demonstrated strong support for the project and for the applicant in their letter. They're going to look at if the mentor has experience and a track record in urologic research to provide the scientific guidance that would be necessary for you to conduct your project. And then there's the evaluation of the research project itself. Can the research project be done within the timeline that is available? To what degree does the project, um, you know, is, is it well organized? Is it clearly presented? Um, does it show the applicant's ability to think clearly? Is the project focused on a significant problem in neurology research? And similar to the prioritization of certain applicants, proposals that address issues related to healthcare disparities among minority populations will similarly receive priority consideration. If you are an applicant who is not from a group underrepresented in medicine, but you have a proposal that addresses healthcare disparities among minority populations, we still encourage you to apply. Finally, they'll be looking at the host institution and assessing to what degree the institution provides a training environment with uh, urologic disease research that will promote the development of you, the applicant. These research funding opportunities are meant to be a learning experience and a training experience for the applicant to poise them for success later on, not only in their medical school, in their residency, and then later as a urology physician scientist. So all of this may appear a bit daunting, but I'm happy to share that this is attainable. And to demonstrate that, I'd like to invite the 2023 recipient uh, to speak with us a bit and tell us about her experiences navigating the applications and her experiences with the award to date. So if you'll join me in welcoming Daniela Orozco Rendon, with her project that focuses on real-time non-invasive monitoring of erectile dysfunction for Hispanic men receiving testosterone replacement therapy. Daniela, how are you this evening? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. 
So I wonder if you could start by telling us a bit about how did you go about finding a research mentor? What was that process like? Yeah, um, I started at my home institution. I knew I wanted to do research for a year. I didn't get to do a lot of it during my third year. Um, so I sat down with the person that I had done some research with at my home institution, kind of let him know what I wanted to do. And so kind of used him and his contacts to send out a few emails. Um, there's a lot of cold emails uh, to try to find somebody who was, um, had an established research year. Excuse my cat in the background. <laughs> okay. So your host institution for your fellowship is not where you're enrolled in medical school. Is that right? That's correct. So, um, uh, Dr. Gross, who is my, from my home institution, knew uh, Dr. Mohit Kara at Baylor College of Medicine, which is where I am right now. Um, and so he was actually able to put me in contact with him. And I sent over a resume, kind of what my plan was. And we did an interview. And that's kind of how we got connected. Okay. Can you tell us a bit about how you approached putting the application together? Um, so I think... For starters, I sat down with Dr. Kara um, when the opportunity presented itself, and we kind of looked at what projects he had in mind, what resources he had access to, and then kind of what my interests were within the field of urology, um, which is where we talked about the firm tech. He already had an established relationship with the firm tech company, so we were I knew I was able to get access to the resources that I was going to need to do the project. Um, and I knew I wanted to take a approach that was more towards minorities, particularly Hispanic men. Um, so we kind of took a project that he had started and tailored it to fit the interest that I had um, and kind of went from there. Okay. Was it, was it daunting to put the pieces together? How did you find yourself amidst all the different components? Um, I think at the beginning, I think it's, biggest recommendation is having a really great mentor um, just because there's a lot of pieces. This happens and for me it happened during my third year of medical school where I was doing clinical rotations so time was limited um, but having that support and I really utilized emailing uh, the contact information that was on the application site made it a lot more helpful um, and so getting in the application wasn't too bad once you actually got started and had a good idea of what I wanted to do. Okay. Can you tell us a bit about your research project? Uh, I understand you've started actually conducting the research now. How's that experience been for you? Yeah. So um, the thought process behind this project was, as of right now, the current use or way that we monitor or check for erectile function in men is using the International Index of Erectile Function, which is a questionnaire, has five parts, and normally part, uh, patients will fill it out in office. And although it's useful and it really helps us get a gauge on how erectile function management is going, it's a subjective um, means of recording. And there hasn't been any great objective measures that are private and a patient can do at home and is simple to use and portable. Um, and so when I learned about firm tech, which is a the equivalent of kind of a for a Apple Watch for your penis, it does a lot of the similar things that we would be trying to gauge with an IIEF. Um, but the patient can do it at the privacy of their home. It collects information straight to their phone. Providers have access to it. Um, so I thought it'd be really cool to use that to see um, impact of testosterone on erectile function and kind of correlate the data that we were getting from IAEF to this firm tech to see if the device was comparable and what the differences we would see would be. How has your experience been at Baylor and in the lab, you know, conducting all the research directly? Um, this year has been great. It's been a huge learning experience. I think one of the greatest things about the fellowship is Coming in, I had done some research, but I hadn't had a chance to take a lot of ownership of a project. And I think this really gave me that opportunity. Um, and having mentorship from Dr. Kara, who has been absolute gem of a human being and has been incredibly supportive, it has been really nice to not just get to work on the project, but also learn from the Boston Scientific Group, 
who provides a lot of support. Um, and then also just the opportunity to network with other great urologists who are in the academic field, who are also really eager to mentor. Um, and it's opened up a lot of doors to other projects that I've had in mind that I didn't get to do at my home institution. And now I've found little homes for them and have actually been able to work on those as well. well that sounds great. Um, you mentioned your interactions with the industry award sponsor, Boston Scientific. Could you tell us a bit more about what all that has involved so far? Yeah, uh, Boston Scientific has been wonderful. Um, Dr. Ron Morton is who is main point of contact. Um, he has been great. Um, they actually came down, I think, two weeks into the program and they brought their stats group. Um, and that's a really great opportunity because you get a whole new lens to your project. It was one thing for me to sit down with Dr. Karen and come up with the project. And then it was a very different thing to have the stat side come in and really, you know, point point to where there could be flaws, which, you know, it could be as simple as maybe this needs to be an exclusion criteria or maybe consider collecting data this way. Um, things that you probably wouldn't think about until you submit a paper and you get re a reviewer's comments like, oh, we should have done that to begin with. So that's been really helpful. Um, and they just kind of did a who run of the mill, like what are like the options for stats? And that was a really great refresher. Um, and then as part of it, you also meet with the stats team once a month and they're really huge support in terms of this is where the project's at now. I'm not sure what to do in terms of either if like we need to open recruitment up a little bit more or how should we be looking at the data? Um, they've been really supportive and a great point of contact every month. Well, it sounds like the continuing education aspects have really been helpful to you. Would you say so? Yes, uh, it has been. Yeah, as as far as research, as far as my career in urology, I think the year has been incredibly beneficial developing myself as a professional, as hopefully a future urologist, just gaining confidence and wanting to be within the space. Well, you have been uh, six months on this grant now. And I'm curious, and I wonder if the audience may be as well, six months in, what do you know now that you wish you had known putting together that application? What what sort of tips and tricks would you have offered to your past self leading into this? Um, I think try to stay flexible and broad um, as far as coming up with a plan it's like most things with plans go, they're never 100% going to go as you think they will, but being ready to pivot and being ready to make amendments as needed um, so that you can have a really great project um, is really helpful. And perhaps thinking of how hard will recruitment be for this project, um, just so that whenever you get into it and you're trying to create an IRB and once you get the IRB approval, um, you're talking to patients to try to recruit them to whatever it is that your project may be, just being able to pivot because as most research goes, it's never exactly how you plan it. Okay, well, that is really helpful. Um, anything else you'd like to tell any of the applicants that potential applicants that are joining us tonight? Um, I'm biased because I did it, but I would highly recommend it. It's a huge learning experience in terms of learning how to put a whole research project together. It's also a really great opportunity to get to work on other projects within whoever you're you're working for as your mentor. And lastly, I think it's a really great opportunity to really learn what urology is, what um, goes into being a urologist, what the day-to-day -day life looks like, and figuring out if that's a space you want to be in and what that would look like for yourself. Fantastic. Well, at this point, I think we're going to start taking some audience question answers. So um, as we are taking question and answers, I also just want to say thank you all for coming tonight or if you're viewing this recording later. If you have any questions that aren't addressed during our, our session, please know that you can email the Office of Research for additional guidance. Our email here is grantsmanager at auanet.org. And with that, I will invite my colleague Adam to read out any of the questions that have been submitted to the Q&A feature or the chat feature.
Sure. So we've gotten a couple questions in here. And the first one that we have is wondering if you could explain or elaborate on what you meant earlier in the presentation when you were talking about how there have to be no academic responsibilities. That's a great question. Essentially, this, this fellowship is set up almost like a gap year. Um, you cannot be attending the lecture in real time and participate in this program. The expectation is that you will be dedicating your workday hours to the research. Um, and that can be a bit tricky. Um, if you are taking classes that do not require in real time attendance, then that flexibility may be available to you. But 100% effort means that essentially you have no clinical obligations and you are not attending lecture or classes or things like that in real time during the business day. All right. So that sounds great. So another question that we got in was wondering if there are, if there are no urologists at a certain med school that you may be at or there are only a couple of urologists at the med school that you were at. Uh, can we do research at a different institution where there might be more urologists that are there? I think I'll let Daniela respond to that. Yes. I, I, my school had a urologist, but I chose to leave just because my institution wasn't able to match um, the grant uh, funding. But I think it's a really good opportunity, especially if your home institution doesn't have a urology program. Um, just to make the connections within the field. My advice to that would be a lot of it's going to be emails, trying to um, get to know other people who have done research. There's research positions within the urology department and trying to reach out to those institutions. Most major institutions have some sort of fellowships already set up um, and trying to reach out to their programs to see if there's anybody who would be willing to participate. Yeah, that sounds great. Uh, thank you for that. Um, so another question that we got in is, uh, is this opportunity available for those who do not match the cycle and choose to delay their graduation? That is a very good question. And the answer is yes. If you choose to delay your graduation, if you choose to postpone going through the match process, you are able to apply for this grant. Assuming you meet all the eligibility criteria we talked about before, that is perfectly fine. The one scenario where you would not be able to apply for this grant, if you have finished undergraduate and are delaying enrollment in medical school, you would not be considered matriculated. So you must either be actively enrolled in medical school or postponing your medical school graduation. I will share that the AUA and the Urology Care Foundation view the Boston Scientific Medical Student Innovation Fellowship as a particularly strong tool to increase your competitiveness with the urology match. So we consider those uh, who would like to apply, who are unsure of their match status, you are always able to submit an application and then withdraw it later if your plans change. Um, but yes, you would be able to apply. Good question. All right. So another question that is related to follow up on that one. Um, one of the participants was wondering if there is a best suggested time while they're in medical school to apply for the fellowship. Mm, I'm actually interested to hear, uh, Daniela, your thoughts on this. Yeah. Um, so I did it after finishing off my third year. I started my fourth just because our school's a little weird, but I mostly completed my entire third year of medical school before I applied. Um, I would suggest the same. I think completing your clinicals, getting your step one and step two out of the way before you totally disconnect from doing medicine for a year is helpful, just so you don't have the looming sense of I have to take my board exams and remember all the material, because it's a pretty demanding year in terms of doing research and learning all of these things. You really want to be able to dedicate your full attention to it. Um, I also think it's a really good opportunity to network before you go in to sub-I season, which would happen during your fourth year. 
um, because you will have met a lot of program directors by going to conferences. So when you go to apply to sub eyes and you go to do your sub eyes, you will have some familiar faces in the crowd once you go out there. So I think doing it after your third year is a good time. However, you could do after second and uh, do it right before you start your clinical years. That's a great, that's a great uh, piece of insight. And I'll just add something you mentioned was the networking component. As part of this fellowship, the AUA and the Urology Care Foundation do provide travel funding for the recipients who come to the AUA annual meeting uh, at least once, if not twice, during their award term. So another opportunity provided through this is to fortify that networking potential at the AUA annual meeting, the opportunity to meet the industry funding partners, and the opportunity to meet other AUA research grantees. Good questions. And I, sorry, I'll add to that. There's a, a physician that Taylor actually introduced me to when we first went to the AUA um, this past, I think, March in Chicago. Um, and I'm actually doing a research project with her now. So the networking is really, really a big part of the year. That's really good to hear. Um, so another question that is uh, fairly unrelated to that last one, but one person wants to know if it matters which air, if it matters what area of urology that they want to research. That's a great question, and the answer is it does not matter. The Urology Care Foundation funds research that could focus on clinical patient data analysis. It funds research that focuses on research like mouse models and cell lines, um, bench, as they say, bench to bedside and beyond. Uh, and we fund research across all disease areas. So assuming that the research topic is innovative in that specific area of research that you're interested in, with particular uh, preference, if it focuses on alleviating the issues experienced by a minority population. Um, there are no other limits to the category of research or the disease area of focus. Perfect. Um, we had one question that was pertaining to applicants that are residing from outside of AUA sections. So if you're residing from, from outside of an AUA section, uh, this one was specifically pertaining to uh, if you're in Russia, um, could the participant in uh, any one of these places outside of the AUA sections participate in this urological research? Good question. If the host institution is matching the $20,000 and they are based within AUA sections, then yes, you could apply. So if you live outside of AUA sections, but the host institution and the research will take place within the AUA section. Example. Johns Hopkins is very close to AUA headquarters. If you lived anywhere across the globe, but you were doing your research here at Johns Hopkins and they provided the matching funds, you would be eligible for this fellowship. That sounds great. It sounds like really, really good to know. Um, Another question that we got in was wondering if there is a difference in application consideration if it is turned in earlier or later in the application cycle. The scientific merit review of the proposals is not based on turning them in early versus the day of the deadline. I will say from a staff perspective, we are always pleased to see applications turned in before the deadline but it will not impact your scoring favorably. Uh, it's just so nice for us to see. And functionally, it means that if you have any unforeseen technical issues with submission, we have a better opportunity to intervene and assist you before the deadline has closed. Perfect. Sounds good. Um, one question that looks like it was asked uh, earlier in the uh, presentation when you were going over um, materials to submit, one person was wondering um, what a bio sketch was and where you could find the formats for it. Another really good question. 
a bio sketch is essentially a scientific research resume. Uh, the National Institutes of Health is the biggest biomedical funder of research grants in the world. And they created what they call the bio sketch as a way to standardize information on what research you have done, what clinical work have you done, where have you conducted your education, what papers have you published, what scientific presentations have you given at a conference. So it is a structured way to present that information that is consistent across applicants. Whether I create a bio sketch or Daniela creates a bio sketch, it will be information presented in the same sections either way. Um, how do you find one? In the application system, we provide a template of the current NIH bio sketch that includes all of the sections of information that can be filled in. We highly recommend that you work with your primary mentor on filling this out because it is a very useful tool. However, we recognize that maybe you came to the application late in the game and you have an academic resume that isn't in the right NIH biosketch format. So we will accept either. Um, Daniela, did you want to provide any insight on putting that together? Uh, yeah, I used the template that was online, but I, I had my primary mentor go over it and I would do it. It's really helpful. It's also really helpful because you'll get asked about it throughout your year if you're trying to set up um, relationships with other people to do research or any other research that you want to do. So it's a good thing to have done and done well going into the year, just so it's one less thing to worry about. Yeah, sure. That's really good to know. Um, so the last question that I have here, um, that seems like it's not exactly related to the Boston Scientific sp specifically, but it wants to know that if there are any other research fellowships or awards that were required taking a year off from school. At the current time, the Urology Care Foundation does not have any other research opportunities that require uh, the 12 month. 100% uh, effort. We do have a medical student fellowship that is the starter package, you could say, whereas the Boston Scientific Medical Student Innovation Fellowship is your Rolls Royce. Um, the medical student fellowships that we offer are for $4,000 and do not require taking a significant amount of time out of your medical school um, or other. So if the 12 months away from medical school is not an option for you, I'd encourage you to look at our medical student fellowships. Uh, they are not as robust in the funding that they offer, but they are an excellent opportunity to still get exposure to urology research with a little bit of grant funding. That sounds great. Um, so, so far, we do not have any other questions that have come in. Well, actually, no, we just had one as I was speaking. Um, so, one last person just asked, can you talk a little bit more about what kind of training you received from Boston Scientific? Danielle, I'm sure this is probably more geared towards you. Yeah. Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, so, the very first meeting with Boston Scientific was official. They came down to uh, Baylor. It was week long. And pretty much the way it was structured was the first few days was like a basic stats so that we were all on the same page. We learned different stats tests, when to use them. Um, and then after that was more centered around the project in the sense of we sat down, you give a really quick a brief presentation of what your project is, what your end measurements are, and how you hope to accomplish that. And their team of statisticians will sit with you and kind of run through the protocol that you've developed. Um, in my case, we really sat down and honed in on what our inclusion exclusion criteria was so that we wouldn't have confounding variables at the end. Um, we really walked through timeline of our project. So for instance, the IIEF in my case was a, it's based off the last four weeks. So we made sure our timeline was conducive to that. Um, and then at the end, more, just more like basic, a little bit more into stats and how that's run. And then the follow-up meetings are really tailored to 
what it is that you might need. Um, the way it's worked is halfway through the month, I send an email to the Boston Scientific Stats team and I either and I discuss what's going on with the project now, things that I might need help with. And then at that meeting at the end of the month, it's about 30 minutes and they really sit down and talk to you about it. They also provide a lot of resources on where to get st information about stats, running stats. Um, and then they're also just have all given me their phone number. So I've been able to text and be like, I'm in the middle of trying to submit an abstract. This is my question about a stats that I'm working on. Am I doing it correct? And they're really good at just guiding and like making sure that you feel comfortable and confident in the work that you're doing throughout the year. Yeah, that sounds great. And then having that type of resource available is always extremely beneficial, especially in the research world. Um, one question that we did just get that I think was a follow up to uh, doing research for something that was coming in from an outside section, outside of AUA sections. Uh, the question is, does this mean that we have to travel to the U.S. to get um, research done, or can it still be done outside of the U U.S., even if it is associated with a uh, um, organization that's within a U.A. section? That's a great question. So the AUA sections are not solely within the United States. They include Canada. They include... Mexico, that includes a large part of Central America, and I think a few of the U.S. territories. So the host institution must be based within those section boundaries, which can be found in full on AUA's website. You can actually search by zip code within the geographic section to see if it is located within one. If the if the research is such that you have to be in the lab to conduct it, or you have a mentor whose preference is that you need to be available in real time to work with them, then yes, it would necessitate you traveling in to that host institution to conduct the research. There are not many scenarios where an application would be an application would be eligible if the entirety of the research proposed was conducted remotely. So this fellowship is intended to be uh, very hands-on. It is intended to get a lot of direct contact and exposure with not only the primary mentor, but as Daniela was mentioning, with the industry sponsors who are based within the U.S., and with the networking opportunities, which are also based within AUA sections. So you do not need to be a U.S. citizen or have um, any of the particular immigration statuses associated with long-term residency in the U.S., but the host institution must be based within AUA sections, accredited, and the project must be conducted in real time on location at that host institution. Good follow-up question. Gotcha. So we haven't had any other last minute questions to come in. So I think with that, um, Taylor, did you have any uh, last um, minute comments that you wanted to address before we end this? No, I just want to say thank you to everyone who attended tonight. Uh, a big thank you to our 2023 recipient and all the fantastic work that she has already accomplished. We're really looking forward to seeing the closeout of not only this project, but where you're going in the future. Um, we highly anticipate seeing you in other AUA research grants. And thank you all for your time tonight. We appreciate it. If you have any additional questions about this funding opportunity or other funding opportunities or research programs offered by the American Urological Association or the Urology Care Foundation, please email us. That's grantsmanager at auanet.org. With that, thank you all so much and enjoy the rest of your evening.